And now, live from Level 5 Productions on the island of Milleronia, it's The Larry Miller Show! Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and everyone who's always wanted to be a tourist in Hollywood. Hi, folks, and welcome back to The Larry Miller Show. I'm Larry Miller, but in a way, aren't we all? And, oh, am I happy today. But it's for regular things, which is the best way to be happy. Colonel Jeff and I are here on, well, on the island of Milleronia, which is a wonderful place to be, if I if I do say so myself. If uh, I know that, that I, I run it strictly, and I know I, I don't kid around about the weather, and I know that some people say I'm a little harsh in my punishments. True, we have two volcanoes, and one is worse than the other, if you can imagine that. And uh, they, they are used by me, by my direction, uh, well, to keep a lot of our citizens in line. It doesn't work on the ones who go in the volcano. They're, they're in line. That, and that, that last fall. But anyway, I'm just being silly. I love it here. And oh, it's a beautiful day. Yes, again, I know I've said this before. I control the weather and I insist that it's always beautiful. But why not? Wouldn't you do that? I like to do that, too. I, I like when it's a beautiful day. And we like, oh, Milleroni is a beautiful place. And, and that music, again, always, every week it gets better. And in every week, it makes me and Colonel Jeff happy to be in our business. And, uh, of course, that's the Ken Israels Orchestra and the Tiana Boscovic Dancers featuring boy tenor Greg Breedlove asking the musical question, If you're whistling through the graveyard, should the tune be the theme from the Adams Family? Well, that's a pretty good question. And uh, I know you know the theme from the Adams Family, and so do I, so does Colonel Jeff. And uh, so it, the question is, if you're whistling through the graveyard, should the tune be the theme from the Adams Family? Yes. Yes, it should be. And uh, that's one of the things that makes it a, a, a heck of a question, Greg. Yes, the tune should be the theme from the Adams Family, but just a little note, be careful. During the finger-snapping part, if you hear a lot of others snapping along with you, head for the hills. And that's no kidding around. And uh, good question, though. And by the way, I have a story for you about the Broadway show the Adams Family. I don't think it's still on, but uh, when it when it came out in New York on Broadway, which was, I guess, about six years ago, something like that, and uh, I was working in New York because Alan Zweibel, who's a good friend and a great writer, what a wonderful comedy writer and comedy thinker and for books and scripts and everything, wrote, oh, wrote for the longest time on Saturday Night Live. He's great, but we were writing something together. And he was invited to go to one of the preview shows of The Adams Family. It was a few weeks before it was opening up on Broadway. So they're in the Broadway theater. And uh, the producers wanted Alan to come take a look and, uh, well, see if he had any thoughts. Uh, you know, and uh, he said to me, you want to come along and we'll both go see The Adams Family? It was in previews, so it was going to be a full house. And I said, sure, good idea. And... Uh, you know what? I, I'll tell you what, folks. Speaking of Greg's question, the theme to the Adams Family, that was the theme to the show. And I'll tell you, it gave me so much pleasure. And Alan, too, that when we were sitting there, as the lights went down and as the show started, they had, well, the theme from the Adams Family came up. That was going to be the theme of their Broadway show. And... You hear it when I'm telling you folks when that came on da 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 and uh when you hear that and then another verse of it and and then when the words came on folks 
there wasn't one person in that theater, including us, who wasn't snapping our fingers and smiling and laughing as we were doing it. Everyone was thrilled that that theme was on. That shows you, by the way, and it shows the producers, it should have, you know, how happy people were that there was going to be a show about the Adams Family. And it was starring Nathan Lane. Oh, was, what a cast. Just a, a terrific cast. And uh, But I'll tell you what, that theme and... Uh, whew, you know, that show was actually terrific on TV. It was a great... Colonel Jeff and I were talking about it. We, we were remembering. Speaking of a cast, Carolyn Jones, John Aston, Jackie Coogan as Uncle Fester, Ted Cassidy as Lurch. These are great names. The regular names are good names. <laughs> but the show names are terrific. And, you know, we were, we, we were remembering that jokes were constantly repeated on that show... But we loved it. We all loved it. Visiting businessmen always had their hats crushed by Lurch. You remember how he would take them off? He wasn't being mean. He's just he just wasn't a very graceful guy, and so he would take slide that hat off, sort of half down the face, and crushing it with that giant hand he had, that big paw, and. Uh, I, I loved all things like that, and he was, uh, as you remember, just, he would, he, he could talk, and he had lines, and he was great, but it was that, uh, that was just the best. I remember that Cousin It lived under the stairs. I loved that, that he had the door to his apartment on the landing of the staircase, and it was, well, it was a small door, because Cousin It wasn't big it was cousin it and uh he had a, a small door so it was a, the door looked about three feet high three and a half feet high and it was a regular door with a doorknob and a frame and a door and so they could go in there it didn't happen an awful lot because how do you tell an actor okay bend over but they would go in and it looked like a nice place chairs a rocking chair the, the bed and you know a couple of rooms to it there and that was cousin it's place but i loved that even as a kid, even as an adolescent, to say, look at that, that's where Cousin It lives. Oh, I loved it, you know, and the kids, we were saying just before, Wednesday and Pugsley, again, great names, Wednesday and Pugsley. Now, one of the most wonderful actresses and beautiful actresses was Tuesday Weld in Hollywood, so that, you know, that was a name. I never, never quite got it as a kid, but I thought, wow, she's beautiful. And uh, so why not Wednesday? But we wondered, what are they doing as adults? Did those kids, we thought they would be huge successes, Wednesday and Pugsley, uh, her brother, because John Aston in it, uh, uh, Mr. Adams, uh, I just forgot his name, was Gomez, Gomez Adams. And he was very successful in the show as uh, some kind of businessman. I mean, that was some kind of business because I, I, I don't know what business that was. But he did have visitors from a business, right? And uh, he was very successful. And he was always, as Colonel Jeff pointed out, he was always uh, reading the Wall Street Journal and uh, with the cigar there or looking at the stock ticker from 1923 or something with the glass over it and coming out. It was wonderful stuff. And uh, we loved, we both loved Thing, which Colonel Jeff thought might have been Ted Cassidy too, as Lurch, where the hand just came out of the little box all over the house, though. Thing had doors, in quotes, into the house, those boxes all over the house. And by the way, if you're the kind of person who says, well, how did he get from one to the other? You don't get the point of the show. He got there. All you have to know is he, he, he he's there. But he, he was very good at acting, looking surprised. Obviously, no lines. But uh, Colonel Jeff found out uh, from the uh, Adams Family ac account on the Internet there that his, well, his name was Thing. And his full name, though, was Thing T. Thing. And as I said, what do you think the middle name was? And he, he made a comical face and said, hmm, I don't know. Thing? 
thing t thing. Well, that's just great. A good comedy writing. And uh, Vic Mizzy wrote the opening theme. And uh, the reason I'm ven- mentioning him there is, uh, first of all, good work, Vic. And we thought, if we're going to mention it, and if we're going to enjoy it, shouldn't we just play it? So here we go. The theme from The Adams Family. And spooky, they're all together, ooky, the Adams family. Their house is a museum, when people come to see them, they really are a scream, the Adams family. Neat, sweet, petite. So get a witch's shawl on, a broomstick you can crawl on, we're gonna pay a call on, the Adams family. That's pretty good, isn't it? If you weren't smiling and rocking your head back and forth to the beat like me and Colonel Jeff, folks, I'm not sure you fully understand show business. But that was that was just terrific, a great theme. And I wanted to tell you that in the Broadway show, when Alan and I went to see it, and uh, sure enough, that theme came up. And there wasn't a person not snapping their fingers along with it. Everyone, you could hear people smiling and laughing and happy laughter. This is before the show started. But just that theme was enough to get people feeling great. I did, too. So did Alan. And, uh, mm. I never, I don't recall ever using finger snapping so well. I don't, no other themes I can think of use the finger snap. By the way, if they do, please write us and tell us. But uh, that was a heck of a show. By the way, I I mentioned there that uh, in the opening credits, the Tahana Boscovic dancers, and she was one of the young women on the Serbian women's volleyball team. Funny, it took it took a while to say all of that. I don't I don't know exactly why, but uh, Colonel Jeff and I happened to be watching that in our homes separately, and they were playing in the finals. They were playing the Chinese women, and uh, oh, that's right. I'm sorry, Colonel Jeff just raised his hand. He said. Clarification, I was in a bar. Well, good. Good for you and good for the Olympics, I guess, too. Well, good for the bar. But uh, he texted me, one of the players on the Serbian team, uh, Tihana Boscovic, really struck us both, so to speak, as, uh, well, just a a terrific-looking young woman. And a great athlete. They were all really fired up and and on on their feed they were doing a great a great job terrific athletes but to be honest we were texting each other about the same thing hey have you seen this boscovic here and we both agreed that she was god bless her you're a great athlete i wish her well but yeah she was someone where you uh you see her in those shorts and you say hold on just a second here I I think there's more happening in international relations than meets the eye. But that's why she deserved a great credit there. They all did. But uh, curiously enough, Colonel Jeff and I both reacted to Tiana 
and uh, in a in a good way, in the best way, certainly a good way for us. And uh, but you know something, given mentioning our Olympics, the Olympics that just finished, that just ended, and uh, there were so many things. I'm normally not a big Olympics fan. I normally, for every one of them, I normally don't get it. In fact, uh, my wife was uh, saying, you know, uh, we were out to dinner with a, another couple and one of our kids, and uh, and we were saying that, hey, you know, look, the Olympics are trying to get back to L.A., or the L.A. is trying to get the Olympics again. And uh, she thought that was a great idea. And my my, uh, I think my kid and I felt more the same way of just, well, that's not. That's all right, you know. Just, ah, uh, you know, we weren't that thrilled about it. And uh, well, that means they'll be all over the city. Well, yeah, and you know, uh, okay. So I'm not normally an Olympics fan, but I'll tell you what, folks, the gymnasts and our women's basketball team, which won six in a row, no team in the Olympics has ever won six in a row of anything, by the way. That was a big first, and they were just wonderful. The men's basketball team won three in a row. And all the sprinters and hurdler, the hurdlers, the thrilling performances and brought smiles and tears to your eyes, I hope. And the stories they had, like Simone Biles and so many others with great tragedy growing up and how hard they worked to do this and how they achieved and how they made us all proud. I was just wondering, has anyone even noticed that the only liars and thieves in the whole thing were slender white men? Has that, Did anyone even notice that? Because I, I kind of did that, well, look at the Olympics, they're great. Well, you know, given everything that's going on in our country right now, has did no one even notice that? That just the really awful, yucky guys going out, knocking, knocking a bathroom around in a in a in a shell station, and you're not even listening to the security guard. And then they trash the bathroom, and they were so well, so awful. They just give the guy fifty bucks, really. You, and you you think in Brazil that's going to be enough to make a new bathroom in a gas station? I don't think so, but in any case, we had so much joy this year, this time in the Olympics, and, well, one giant nerd, one awful guy, and uh, he's white with blue hair, and at any rate, but there you are, and by Amazon and PayPal. And my book. You know what, folks? Amazon is still the greatest company in the world. They do three things no one else can do, and I'm proud to say it. I'm proud to be with with them. And the three things they do are, one, whatever you order, you get. Whatever you think of, you get. That's an amazing thing if you think about it. You go to Amazon, whatever it is, you'll get it. The second amazing thing is they, by the way, they already have it. They don't even have to order it themselves. They don't have to make it. They have it. They have a giant warehouse a mile long and a mile wide and a mile high and a mile deep. That's pretty big, by the way, for a warehouse. And they already have it. And the third thing they do, which is the most wonderful thing, is they send us a percentage of whatever you order. And that's pretty great. Here to the show, to me and Colonel Jeff, and uh, that money, of course, goes right in our box for our next big fancy fried chicken dinner with two drinks beforehand in a different place. And yes, it's true, last time we called Dr. Chris up in, uh, well, as a gesture of friendship and commitment. And he came with us to our second big fancy fried chicken dinner with two drinks beforehand in a different place. And uh, this time for the third one, we may, we may... Might, I'm not saying I'm going to call him, and Colonel Jeff isn't saying he's going to call him. We might. He's still studying clog dancing, by the way, for a doctorate at the University of Solvang, northwest of us here. 
Well, not here, not on Milleronia, but <laughs> northwest of us on Milleronia is, well, sharks. But, <laughs> but I'm not telling you where it is. In any case, though, Amazon does a great job with that. If you want, you can go to Amazon on your computer or on your laptop, on your iPhone, whatever you have. But don't do that. Come to us. Go to our website, LarryMillerHumor.com. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just laughing there because I forgot the name and Colonel Jeff corrected me. Go to our website, LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. <laughs> That sounds like one of the effects from the Adams Family theme. Boy, those were good effects. So, you know what, though? Go to our website. We have a banner that says Amazon. You click that, then go to sleep, take a nap, lie back in your in your big easy boy chair or lazy boy chair. I like those words, by the way. That's good words for a company. They tough chairs? No, they're easy and lazy, just like us. And uh, do that, though. Take a nap and put a magazine over your face and and hit it because uh, we'll get you to Amazon. And we also have a banner for PayPal. What a terrific group they are. I like them a lot. And uh, as I've been saying, and it's true, you if you deal with PayPal, you work with them, and you know what? You feel like you're saving the world, and who knows? Maybe you are. So uh, do that. If you enjoy the show... And why wouldn't you? And if you'd like to send us a few bucks to help out, and why wouldn't you? You can do it through PayPal. And I, you know what? I I never like saying donate uh, this or pay what you like. Join the Platinum Committee. I always like to say buy us some drinks. That's the best way to go because there are different levels. Levels one through five all the way up to... We're driving to Florida! <laughs> <laughs> Everyone sounds like they're in the Adams family to me now, even that audience. They're a great audience. And so do that. Look for the PayPal banner on our website also, LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. <laughs> yeah, just that's a good that's a good one though. Colonel Jeff was a little embarrassed by that. But no, you pick great ones. And remember, everything on Milleronia is terrific. If I like it, it's good on Milleronia. And that's the definition there. In any case, and by me, by my book, Spoiled Rotten America. And it's now for sale at, uh, at a website that's store dot comedyfilmnerds.com and these are signed hardcover copies of my book I'm very happy with it uh, it's funny and I enjoyed writing it and I worked hard on it and it did great when it came out and you know what well make it great again just keep going and uh, buy some from uh, store.comedyfilmnerds.com and uh, you know what that brings me to my favorite part of the show the joke of the week. <laughs> uh, well, this is a good one. This made Colonel Jeff and I both laugh. And I love telling a joke every week to you. And I, uh, if it's a good one, I hope you like it. And you laugh too. And t tell it to a friend and a family member. And, uh, well, an old school chum. But you know what? This is a pretty good one. There's uh, a police officer walking through Lover's Lane by a little small river in his hometown, in his city there. And he's not thrilled about this part of the job. You know, he doesn't like annoying people. But, well, that's part of the job. You know, that, that's that's what he is. He's uh, he's an officer. He's, he's on the police. And he's got to make sure these folks don't get too crazy and, uh, you know, just get out of there when it's time to get out of there. So he goes up. He sees one car and... Uh, it's, it's a little smoky there. The windows are all, uh, you know, clouded up there. 
And so he goes up and he takes his, uh, well, he takes his walking stick. He takes the police club and he tap, tap on the window, on the driver's window. And the driver's window slides down. And he sees a young fella in there reading a book. And that's it. And he, and he just looks at the driver and then he looks in the back seat. And there's a young woman there, a very lovely young woman, and she's just uh, doing her nails. She's uh, manicuring her own nails there and uh, with that little metal scraper, and she's doing that. And he looks at the driver again, looks at her again, and uh, the driver says, Is anything wrong, officer? And uh, the cop says to him, You know what, son, I have to tell you something. I've been doing this for 13 years and uh, walking this path and this post, and I have to tell you, I've never seen anything like you two. And uh, that that goes a long distance, because I've seen some wild stuff. And the cop says to him, what are you doing here? And uh, he says, I'm reading a book. And the cop says, well, how about her? What's she doing here? And the guy says, she's doing her nails. And the officer just stands there. He's a little puzzled and says to the driver, how old are you? And the driver says, I'm 20. And the cop says, well, how about her? How old is she? And the driver checks his watch and says, well, in about 15 minutes, she's going to be 18. <laughs> I think that's a pretty good joke. <laughs> And so does Colonel Jeff. Well, so they're just more or less biding their time. And that was either her idea to wait, well, probably his <laughs> to wait, just in case. In any case, that's the joke of the week, and I hope you liked it. And that brings me to my second favorite part of the show, The Poetry Corner. That Adams Family cough of that fella's always makes me happy to be offering a poem the same way I offer a joke. I hope you like it. And uh, this is a good one by a great poet and a great American thinker, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Well, he he is a great American poet. He, he's American. He lived from 1807 to 1882. And he was a famous poet, too, born in Portland, Maine, lived in Massachusetts, and he wrote many things that you do know. The Song of Hiawatha, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, and Evangeline, a great poem. I was saying to Colonel Jeff, Midnight, Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, it's a great poem, poem anyway, but it's, it's one of those where you and I both know the first two lines. Well, listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. And God bless him. Longfellow was great. Even those two lines that, wow, I want to hear that now. And you know what? I said to the colonel, why don't we do that one the next week or two coming up? And he agreed. And uh, this is a good one, too. It's called Footsteps of Angels by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. When the hours of day are numbered and the voices of the night wake the better soul that slumbered to a holy, calm delight. Ere the evening lamps are lighted and like phantoms grim and tall, shadows from the fitful firelight dance upon the parlor wall then the forms of the departed enter at the open door. The beloved, the true-hearted, come to visit me once more. He, the young and strong, who cherished noble longings for the strife, by the roadside fell and perished, weary with the march of life. They, the holy ones, and weakly, 
who the cross of suffering bore, folded their pale hands so meekly, spake with us on earth no more. And with them the being beauteous who unto my youth was given, more than all things else to love me, and is now a saint in heaven. With a slow and noiseless footstep comes that messenger divine, takes the vacant chair beside me, lays her gentle hand in mine, and she sits and gazes at me with those deep and tender eyes, like the stars, so still and saint-like, looking downward from the skies, uttered not yet comprehended is the spirit's voiceless prayer soft rebukes in blessings ended breathing from her lips of air oh though oft depressed and lonely all my fears are laid aside if i but remember only such as these have lived and died isn't that lovely? And uh, yes, as the colonel and I both said, that footsteps of angels, well, they're coming for this fellow. And this is a very poetic, very beautiful way to think of the end of this life. They are coming to get him, to collect him, to bring him to glory. And he sees it that way. And then he, as he says, well, he's not scared. He just knows, how do you like that? Get a load of this. This is the way they do it. And that's fine with him. And it's fine with us. Thank you, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, for a wonderful poem, Footsteps of Angels. I hope you liked it, folks. And that brings me to my third favorite part of the show. M M M. The Triple M Magic Movie Moment. Folks, this is a wonderful movie. I, I hope you've seen it many times like me. And uh, there's also a reason I'm bringing it up, but it's a terrific movie. The Americanization of Emily from 1964, written by Patty Chayefsky directed by the great Arthur Hiller, and starring James Garner, Julie Andrews, Melvin Douglas, James Coburn, William Wyndham, Edward Binns, and Joyce Grenfell. And I'm raising her name for a reason. Uh, by the way, Sharon Tate is also in this movie. It's a small part, and in 1964... I'm sure she was glad to have it. She plays a beautiful young woman. And uh, as it said in, in the movie review, she's uncredited at this point. But how moving to hear her name and to wish her well because of it. And I mentioned Joyce Grenfell there. It's, this is a wonderful movie about World War II, and it's in England in World War II. And James Garner is playing... A, a dog catcher. And that's the phrase they used. Their job was to get the executive officers, the admirals and the other folks like that, to get them, well, things they wanted. They wanted cartons of cigarettes and strawberries and, well, all sorts of things. You know, in fact, an endless number of things. And uh, he's... He's he's kind of he calls himself sort of a sort of a coward. He's not one of the fellows who's really psyched about being there. And well, with D Day coming up, they know the invasion is coming up that they're going to do. And uh, it's a terrific movie. And he meets along the way Julie Andrews, who plays Emily Barham, and uh, her life has sadness in it because she and her mother lived together in the house she grew up in, and their family had losses in this war. Killed in battle were, well, her husband 
and her father and her younger brother. And that's why Emily, played by Julie Andrews, is, well, is is sad and has a, you know, a, a tough demeanor there. And, and, and she plays it just beautifully. Julie Andrews is great in everything. And her mother, played by Joyce Grenfell, is played brilliantly. And this woman, this poor woman in the movie, remember, the, the woman in the movie, the mother, has lost her husband, her son, and her son-in-law in battle. Those are very powerful things. And she has a little straying in her mind. Her She's, well, she has a bit of a condition. She's developed, she can't take it. She doesn't want to believe this. It's too much for her to handle. And her character is very pleasant and very lovable, but she's always talking about, well, her husband and son and son-in-law, as if they're about to come back home. She loves them so much. And we see it the way James Garner sees it. Well, she's a little crazy. But Julie Andrews just says, you know, uh, do, can't you just accept this? Can't you take it? That that her mother must be this way and is chosen to be this way? And we see that throughout the whole movie. And then there's a scene. It's a great movie, folks. But there is a scene where... It's a good scene, a long scene, where James Garner is talking to Mrs. Barham, the mother, and he starts to talk her out of it. He talks her down. He said they're in her house, and he does, it's in an affectionate way, but it's also, well, a no-holds-barred way, and he says, well, you wouldn't want to feel this way and just and he does it and that you know uh, the woman looks so well acted the woman looks a little stricken by being told this or being not just taken down hauled down this way and there's a well julie andrews isn't happy about this and comes in and says and, she, and she's mad because she still doesn't know how to feel about James Garner. She doesn't know whether she's really falling in love with him or whether she's just like so many of the other English girls at that point. Uh, you know, being, well, they were being Americanized. That's where it comes from in those days. Americanized meant a young English woman who would go out with or sleep with some of the, well, higher-rung Americans, and they would get things in return that they needed that they didn't have. Well, like cigarettes and strawberries and stockings and things like that. And it turns out, though, the mother, played by Joyce Grenfell, it's so beautifully done. She's glad that James Garner or Charlie in it. His name is Charlie Madison in the movie. And she thanks him because he did bring her back into the world and it's where she wanted to be. And folks, it's so well done. The movie is so well done. It's called The Americanization of Emily and from 1964. Please see it if you haven't. You'll be glad you did. And if you have seen it, Many times, like me, see it again. And, well, you'll know why you keep seeing it many times. Please do, and let us know. It really means a lot to me and to Colonel Jeff. If you do see it, when you do see it, please tell us on our website. And, you know what, It's there are tiny things we forget in life sometimes. There are things that... Well, we stop understanding how great they are. And it's important to know that they are. We, uh, my older son, as I've told you before, is, is a Marine deployed into the Middle East on duty there. And well, he's doing his job. God bless him. I, and he's well. Uh, but he sent us a text the other day. He said, We've been there almost two months now, and uh, 
It's pretty hot there, as you may, may know. Well, how do you not know that? It's the Middle East. The only thing it gets is pretty hot. And that's pretty hot meaning, oh, 130 degrees, 135, 140. I mean, it's very, very hot. Do they get used to that? Well, they have to. They drink a ton of water, and they, have, well, they have to wear a lot of equipment and for, well, doing their jobs and for protection. And uh, he texted us back that where he is, and I'm not supposed to say where, but where he is, he said the other day, it was 106 degrees, which was so much cooler than it is normally. I mean, that's normally a lot. That's a lot for you and me. But he said it was 106 degrees, and he said all the Marines, all the fellows, he knows his friends and from his company, his platoon, everyone where he is, and all the officers, all the senior folks, every Marine spent that whole day talking about the temperature because they were so thrilled. Can you imagine that? It went down to 106 for one day, and they couldn't stop talking about it. How terrific that was. And he, then he wrote down as a text, you know, uh, well, that you know, he after, after writing that, he said that, uh, I'm not sure I can trust my mind anymore. He thought it was so, well, so ridiculous that that's what they were talking about. But he supported it. He did it. I mean, he was one of the ones saying, hey, maybe it'll go down to 105 tomorrow. You know, that that, that was thrilling for them. But it's, it, it struck me, it turned out Colonel Jeff and I started talking about this, that in all things in our lives as Americans— and uh, especially in Hollywood, uh, he said that he has an old saying that gee whiz turns to ho-hum pretty quickly. And you're not excited about things the way you used to be. But you know what? First of all, I think that's a good way to put it, that gee whiz turns to ho-hum pretty quickly. But not to me. And he and I started talking about that because I love the little things in life, and they remind me, and I remind myself of them, about how good they are and how how wonderful that is that these things happen. You know, that they they have a, I had a, an office at Universal for a, a long time, eight years, nine years, and I saw the tourist trains going by. Those are, uh, well... For uh, tourists, they, I want to say buses, but they're not buses. They're little trains of uh, carts that are open seating, and uh, they have no walls, and people sit down in them, and they're hooked together like trains. So there are two or three of them in a, in a row. Tram cars. That's what Colonel Jeff reminded me of. They're called tram cars. And... Uh, they went by all the time, and people were so happy to be on them. They're getting the tour at Universal. All good studios have those, and they should. They're 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 wonderful. And on the and on the tram cars at Universal, they always have uh, a guide uh, employed by Universal, of course, not just a passenger from Indiana who wanted to, but he's got a microphone there and a public address system. And he's pointing out everything. They're getting the tour of Universal. And you know what? They were always very nice. When I was, uh, well, I have an, an office there, as I mentioned. And then I was in many movies shot on that, all those sets at that studio. And as I was walking by, wherever I was, when a tram car went by, those guides were very nice. They would always say on the loudspeaker system that, Oh, folks, look, there's Larry Miller. He's an actor I bet you like, and he's in so many things here, and uh, he's a comedian, too. They were very sweet, these folks and the guides, and everyone on, on the trams would wave, and I would wave back. It made me feel so good, and not just being noticed, but being part of it. And you know what? I, I said to folks, you know, sometimes I'd see them, Oh, at the lunch there, or at the at the lunch buffets, or at the nicer lunch place, and they said, uh, "Oh, yeah, it was so nice." And you waved back at us too. And I would always say, 
And I say it to you now, and I meant it then and I mean it now, that, you know what? Thank you for saying that, but I'm, I would do that forever. I said, if I weren't in show business, I promise you, I would be on that tram with you looking at everything. And I would be waving at people I knew too. And I would be hoping they'd wave back too. And that's one of the things I'll never forget. It was wonderful when folks would wave. I never had it in me and never will to just, uh, oh, not wave back or, oh, get annoyed or, have you been annoyed? Annoyed? I don't even know what that would mean. It's wonderful. Not excited as I used to be? I am. I'm still as excited as I used to be. I am, and I'll never stop. And, you know, in fact, at Universal there, I had in the office I was in, it was a nice nice building, too. It was uh, three stories, and um, it's a great place to work. And I was a writer there, and I was writing scripts and pitching them. And uh, I was visited once. Well, friends used to come by every so often, but uh, I was visited once by um, Russell and Simon, two brothers from England, uh, who were uh, the nephews of my good friends, the Hamiltons. And uh, Russell had just, in fact, had signed on with the Marines. And he was, uh, before he went through basic training, he was coming out with his brother, and they wanted to say hello. I had met them in England once, in fact. And I said, what a terrific idea. Come by, and they came to the office. And I got one of the golf carts that every office has. Every company, a movie company or a writing company or anything, will always have three or four golf carts in their garage. And I took one of those and loaded them in, and we took a tour, my own tour for them of Universal. And it's things that I love. And I think things you would love, too. You go by on a lot of the sets that never get torn down. They get used again and again and again. The sets that you would remember, you've seen already. The uh, the big city hall with the clock on it from Back to the Future. And it's just still there out in the open. And that street, all those streets and all those buildings, they're still there. All the, and in many other areas there, well, there are city streets that have, in case you're shooting a gangster movie or a movie that takes place, uh, well, the way you need city streets for it. And they have neighborhoods that will never be taken down. I love that about movie studios. Oh, I guess maybe they do some things wrong, but they never destroy things that I love, that you would love too. I took them up to see the Leave it to Beaver house. There's a whole street there that's still there and still used. I've worked in it several times uh, as an as an actor, and it's still there and from the beginning of Leave It to Beaver when they play that great song, and you see the boys walking home from school along that curved street, and they walk into their house. That's Universal, and it's still there. And I showed that to them, and some things from Animal House, and uh, also the uh, from. Uh, Oh, the 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 horror, the horror movie with Anthony Perkins and Janet Lee, Psycho. Yeah, how do you forget a name like Psycho? By the way, that 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 house, the motel, still still there. They're wonderful things to see, and uh, in fact, I so I drove them around a bit, and then we were going to go to lunch. And the thing about me and driving them around, though, in a golf cart or driving anyone around, is I only I know four or five things to show. And I, I can show people four or five things, but I really have no idea where I'm going. I should know more about where I'm going. They have, well, the tours that you can just accidentally get involved in. And I mean, accidentally. Well, maybe if you're not that bright like me. And I took one of the paths that took me into the Jaws portion of the tour. And I don't know where I'm going. I don't want to be part of this. And Sure enough, I said I was riding them around and we're on a, well, one of the one of the paths there. And they're all fully made concrete paths. But I noticed the water is rising. It was, it was the whole part it just started of, well, Jaws. 
You know what happens there. And then the water started rising on the path we were on. And uh, I stopped and I, and, the, and <laughs> so the three of us are in the golf cart saying, more or less, well, well, what do we do now? And I was just honest. And I said, boy, you got me. I, I, the water rose, number one, over the pond level and onto the, the grass level and to the path level and then up the tires level. Now, the question is, what happens now? I don't know. And I said to them, you know what? Uh, I think maybe we ought to better just wait here. First of all, I don't know. The, the path is obscured now, and you can't even see where you're going. But I said, why don't we just wait here and see what happens? And, well, if it goes above, it comes up to head level, I think we can just swim for it and go to lunch dripping wet. But... You know, they, they said fine. I wasn't trying to be funny. And uh, and sure enough, another that was when another <laughs> tram car went by. He was very nice. The guide again, a different fellow, was saying, Hey, you guys all right? You need some help down there? And we, uh, we said, Oh, no, thank you. Because they were on their path, too, higher than ours, of course, because this guy knew where he was going. And uh, it was about uh, 30 or 40 feet away. And then he said again, it was very nice. He said, oh, hi, fo hey, folks, look, that's Larry Miller, an actor, and said something awfully nice. And I said, thank you. And they waved at us, and we waved back at them. And uh, that's another nice memory. But you know what? Then we went to lunch because the water, sure enough, it got to the top of the tires and then started going down. Why? I don't know. There was no giant switch that someone you know just clicked and i said wow okay and they said oh all right and i turned down the water went down back to the water level to the pond level and i i turned the thing back on and it went back on the cart i said well hey what do you think of that it went on and then i put it in gear and forward and it worked it went so all right we shrugged the three of us and went to we were dry and we went to lunch on the lot there. They have some awfully nice places. Well, you know, you might think, not think they were so fancy, but I always liked them. There was a big lunch buffet there, and you could get anything you wanted. And they had a nicer place where you can sit down at tables and uh, get served by waiters and waitresses. So we went there, and we had something uh, something awfully nice. And then, yep, then Ru Russell started in the Marines, and... Uh, became an officer. He wanted to be a helicopter pilot. And he did. And uh, we still have, we went to visit him down at the Marine bases here with our kids. And uh, well, and it was awfully nice to have a picture of them in our hallway there. Uh, and I'm sorry to say he died. He was killed in a plane crash. And they looked pretty well for him. The Marines do things like that very well. But he was already gone. And uh, I'm sorry to say that. God bless you, Russell. But uh, we were in the golf cart that day, folks. And we were laughing that day. And we had a good lunch that day, too. And you know what? It's so funny that uh, Colonel Jeff reminded me that in that area at Universal, and I th but I think more than any other studio, they keep using those sets again. And as I said, I've worked in the Leave it to Beaver house several times, and uh, he mentioned he looked this up, but he knew that Humphrey Bogart, in the movie called The Desperate Hours from 1955, and that movie was shot in the Leave it to Beaver house. And that's... Well, that's not a cheerful movie. That's a pretty serious, dark movie. And, you know, there's, there's nothing I love more than show business than things like that. I love things being used again. I love the Edith Head building for wardrobe, which was just a, f a few buildings down from where my office was, right on the canal area there at Universal. And by the way, if you know Edith Head, I hope you do, one of the great designers in the history of American movies in Hollywood, great designers for wardrobe. 
and uh, one of the great heads of design and wardrobe. And you know what? I, I love every time I go there to be fitted for something. I love that someone has a job there in that building. And it's a five-story building, I think. And uh, someone has a job, and they keep changing them. They have all the old design pictures, just in 8 by 10 frames. And they frame them, as they should, just to keep them well. But they keep changing them. And if you're interested, and I am, as you walk by going to your fitting room, you can look at each one. And maybe the new one's up. I remember there's one that said, Miss Garson's gown from the ball scene. And someone had just designed that, of course, for Greer Garson. And it was really well designed. And But I just love seeing that someone did that. I love that they're there in the wardrobe building. And they keep all the clothes from everything. They keep them for so long. So long. They're in the middle of the building. You can still see them. They go up and down five floors and many stories below that. You can't see how low they go or how high they go, but they're there like a giant dry cleaners with clothes on racks going around and they can pull up anything. And I would used to see things. I would be hanging there and I knew folks there and they knew me and they didn't mind if I walked behind the counter there and I saw, well, a big suit hanging on one. And I just opened the jacket and the, and the name label said, Oh, Hardy. And I thought, holy mackerel. This was worn by Oliver Hardy in one of their movies together. And they don't throw it out. So, you know what? Well, it means a lot. And by the way, something funny happened in one of those fittings to me because I was, I like them all. I like, I like this whole world. And they uh, fitted me with something. It was a nice wardrobe room with the big three. Uh, you have a step you can get up on, and uh, and it's in front of three really nice, fancy-looking mirrors. And uh, they're in three sections. And as you're standing there, I remember thinking to myself, say, this suit looks pretty good. You know what? I, th I, I think maybe I've lost a couple of pounds, and that's, and that's good. And, uh, yeah, I think I'll look good in this movie, in this uh, suit. And it was, it was nice, four or five suits, and I felt good because I'm looking a little... Uh, and I said that to the wardrobe women, whom I, I knew. I knew these folks. And uh, as I said, boy, I'll tell you what, I think I've lost a couple of pounds here, and your suits are looking good that you made for me here. Thank you very much. And I glanced in the mirror, and I saw them, and they were, <laughs> they were kind of turning away a little, and they were embarrassed. And I... And I said, what are, what's, what's wrong? I said, uh, and I turned to them and looked at them. I said, no, I like them. I like the suits. And I, I've apparently lost a couple of pounds. That's that's good news. And they were also the same way, just still kind of looking away a little and going, well, okay, Larry, you know, it's, well, it's good to see you. And I, and, I, and I looked at them for a second, and then it just hit me. I said, is there something with these mirrors that, make the actors look slimmer and you know what you're not supposed to know that and the truth is yes there is something with those mirrors and from the last well, 80 years of hollywood doesn't matter who you are like well it could be greer garson john wayne anybody stands up on that podium there and looks in those mirrors and they're gonna think Hey, I've lost a few pounds. No, it doesn't. They don't. They don't make you look as if you've lost thirty pounds, but they make you look as if you've lost well six or seven pounds. And uh, and every actor is supposed to leave there thinking, "I look pretty good in this. I'm really going to work hard on this movie." <laughs> and they were. I said to them, "You guys are great. I love you. You know that. And I'm not." And they said, "Please don't tell anyone." <laughs> I said, I wouldn't tell a soul. Well, just you guys, just 10 million people. But I mean, it's because no one's supposed to, actors aren't supposed to know. Well, part of wardrobe is to make the actor feel better. Hey, and feel good and feel ready for a great part. If you're a tough guy in a war picture, or if you're a beautiful woman in a private school picture, or another war picture, I don't know, or a sheriff. In Rio Bravo, 
Well, you know what? You might look a little slimmer than you actually are. But you know what? It's a wonderful place to be, those studios. I I worked, as I said, at Universal, and I was in the two Princess Diaries movies, and they were directed by Gary Marshall, and uh, who, as you know, just passed away. And, uh, folks, it was a n- nice days when... And these are shot at Universal. And during Princess Diaries 2, uh, I had uh, one of the producers called me up because I, in my office there and said, hey, why don't you come on up and uh, say hi and uh, and we might have a bite of lunch there. And uh, I said, oh, okay, because they were shooting outdoors, a parade scene from from the second movie, from Princess Diaries 2. And God bless him, Gary was such a great director. So I went up there to the little covered area where they sit with the video feedbacks and, uh, oh, eight or ten directors' chairs, and Gary's in one of them, and everyone has the headphones on, the headsets. And uh, Chuck, oh, boy, was the cinematographer. Great guys, great people. And, uh, in fact, I asked him once, I asked Chuck once what Panavision meant, and it was on this set because uh, they were using as the as the parade in Genovia, if that's the name, or Moronia, or whatever the name of the country was. I should know this, shouldn't I? I'm I'm in the thing. I should know it. But as they were coming down, and Gary said to me, he said pointed to the, the courtyard area there that they were shooting to and getting people uh, citizens of Genovia to wave flags and smile and laugh. And uh, he said, does that look familiar to you then with the steps and this and that? It's where they shot Spartacus. And, uh, well, for goodness sake, that's another example to me. I said, how do you like that? Still there and still used. And the parade would come down with the music playing. da 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 it was wonderful, and people on the sides there, the civilians waving the Genovian flags and happy and clapping, and the stars of the movie, well, you know, Julie Andrews and Anne Hathaway and Hector Elizondo, and me, I'm in it. And I said, how do you like that? And uh, and I <laughs> said, thanks, Chuck. I didn't need to hear about what Panavision was anymore, because he's a great guy and a great pro. And anything he says, I won't understand anyway. So, you know, it was actually silly. I don't want to bother the man because he's excited about it. He wants to talk about the different shots he's using. And, uh, folks, you know what? I went back to and guys, so you'll join us for lunch over here at one thirty, whatever it is at the, uh, at the set there where they, at base camp where they have all the, uh, well, all the trailers. I said, sure, great. I'll see you then. And I walked back about a quarter mile, half mile to my office and walked back through, well, a lot of the sets that are still used again that had productions there that day on different sets you've already seen in other movies. And I got back to my office and I sat down there and did a little writing and then went and had a little lunch. But I remember folks thinking, this was great. That's a great day in show business. It's great to be in show business. That's what I tell every group of parents, every set who says, well, I think my kid wants to get in show business. What should I say? And I always say the truth. What I say, I'm going to tell you the truth. Can you handle the truth? <laughs> they always smile and I said, so what? What's That's great. You know what? What would you rather, that the the kid goes to work for IBM and then gets fired when he's 38? Would you rather have that? I said, come on, let him get in show business, and he's going to be great. Who knows what's going to happen? He could be the biggest star in the world. But, yeah, support him. Just say good luck and make a nice dinner for him and just love the time he's with you now. And, boy, folks... When people say sometime, are tourists in Hollywood annoying? And that happens. And I always say, good Lord, no. How could you say something like that? It's the most wonderful things to see. Remember, these folks planned and saved 
to do this, to come to Hollywood and take these tours and to see and soak it all in. And I'm glad they did. They got tickets for those big red buses on the street with the roofs cut off and for the for the tram cars on studio lots. And they're thrilled to be seeing Hollywood Boulevard and Grauman's Chinese Theater and the Egyptian Theater and the red carpets for premieres. I mean, they're thrilled to see that. And it's the truth. I've been, I've come there to park in, in a parking lot above a bowling alley on, on Highland Avenue, which is where you're supposed to park, where I was told to go. And then you walk out on a Hollywood Boulevard for a premiere that I'm in. <laughs> and so you walk onto the red carpet there, and they have guards there at the fences. And they're so nice, you know, as they, they smile at you and say, no, you can't uh, go. And then they'll say, oh, hello, Mr. Miller. Yeah, you're Cause they're a little surprised you haven't pulled up in a limousine. And I always say, look, oh, I just drove here. I lived down the block a couple of miles. But you know what? And then you you walk out onto the red. Then they open the gate up of the fences, and you walk on there, and you wave at the people who are also smiling. They'd like to be on the red carpet too. And I love being there. And then you see, you know, whoever it is running those things on the side to get to do interviews with people. You know, that. <laughs> Like Donny Osmond, whom I knew I loved from his show with Marie, and I always see him here and there, and he, he called me up, come here, come here, and he, we talked for a minute about this or that, and then he said, so you going to the premiere now? I said, yes. He asked if there was something to tell about it. I said, there is, but look, I think that looks like Julia Roberts coming, and I, I think you probably want to talk to her. I mean, I'm glad to say hi, but that's the reason you're here. That's the reason she's here. And uh, so we left, and that was great. And the point is, it's great. It's good to be there. It's a good day in show business. And I meant what I tell folks all the time. If I weren't in show business, I'd be on the buses with them, and I had to have the same smiles on my face too. And I'll bet you, you would too. I know that, but you and I know the same things. Homer is Homer and Pluto is a planet. And remember, as always, if you walked out of bed today and had a job to go to and a home to come back to and someone there who cares about you, folks, the game's over and you've won. And you're in show business too. Be well and we'll see you here next time. <laughs>